All right, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are doing our annual all hands or our monthly all hands meeting, and we will get going here right about now. I just want to start with a couple of quick updates and run through the agenda. Um, as I said, a couple of updates, and then I'm going to turn over for today's guest speaker, Mount Allen with the San Francisco Jazz, and he's also a student at Fresno State University out in California. And, and please go ahead with any questions. We'll be monitoring the chat as we go. So first of all, a big, huge welcome to Jennifer Kim, who has just joined the MSCC as, the, as a CI engineer. Unfortunately, Jennifer cannot be with us today because she is off on her first trip down at University of Maryland Eastern Shore for the workshop that we're hosting there today. Uh, hopefully, y'all all got the announcement about that in uh, an email, as well as it's also on the website. And I'll throw that into the, thank you, Lanika. She's throwing in my little links for me as we go. Thank you. And then as uh, many of y'all know, we had our first annual meeting last month in Atlanta. We've posted the content to the MSCC website. And you know, please feel free if you were unable to join us last month to take a peek at that content. We went through a lot of what the MSCC is up to, uh, future things, and we did our first student hackathon. That's the picture you'll see in the lower right-hand corner on your screen is the students that were able to join us down in Atlanta for our first hackathon. I want to say it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 or so students from a number of different HBCUs across the, primarily the Southeast. And then we've also been putting up all of the content from the workshops that we've been hosting over the past year. We've got the content from each one of these uh, workshops from North Carolina a and State University that we were do that we did literally a year ago today down in Greensboro, uh, as well as the content from Salish Kootenai College out in Montana, Jackson State that we did last November, as well as Claflin that we did this past March in, down in South Carolina. So please feel free to take a look at that content when you are able to. And then, as I mentioned today, right now, as we speak, we're doing the workshop at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So we've got a number of folks uh, from the community, as well as the staff who are in Maryland right now doing that workshop. And we'll be getting that content posted to the website as well in the very near future. And also, just in case you were unaware, we're doing a series of community of practice calls and meets monthly. We just did uh, our second one the other day on Tuesday of this week, where we're bringing together a number of uh, folks from the community who are interested in CI plan development. And we're sending the uh, Zoom link out via calendar invites as well as email. So please stay tuned on your email to find out about that. And we also have a page on our website about the community of practice. And then finally, uh, a number of y'all might be interested in doing CC star proposals and the next deadline for those I believe is September 11th. And uh, the MSCC is offering um, staff to, here to take a look and help you with your CC star proposals. But with the deadline looming in approximately uh, two and a half months, we do urge you to reach out sooner rather than later if you're interested in um, our help with a CC star proposal. Please feel free to contact Lauren Michael directly. Um, her email is there on the screen, and I believe we'll be getting that posted into the chat as well. And I see a, a hand raised. Dr. Allo, did you have a question? You're on mute. If yeah. you... Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry. I can. Uh, yeah, no, this is good uh, about the CC star. I'm just wondering, I haven't looked at it recently, um, but you know, as they, um, each year they sort of update the solicitations. Uh, so um, are there any changes in the highlights as to what they're looking for uh, to fund in the proposal? That, 
That I do not know. Lauren would be able to answer that question a little bit better. And unfortunately, she's not with us today. She's down in Maryland for the workshop there. But she okay. feel free to contact her and she'll be able to help you out with that. OK, thanks. Gotcha. Any other questions or comments before I uh, move on to our guest speaker today? Okay, so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mount Allen, who is with the San Francisco Jazz, and he's also taking classes at Fresno State uh, at the at right now. And with that, Mount, would you like to bring up your presentation and take it away? And Mount, you're on mute. Please hold technical difficulties. <clears throat> Mount, are, how are you doing? Mount? Uh, can you hear me now i can hear you now yay just like apologies, the commercial apologies uh and let me try and bring my uh presentation back up it's it did a screen flip on me um thanks for your patience and Oh. Gosh. Are you still with me? We are, and we're seeing your whole desktop, just so you know. Okay. You know, I had it up, but I, I apologize. Oh. Okay, well, I'm gonna try. Here, I, I see your presentation. Okay. There we go. Excellent. Now, do you also see a, a a white blob in the center or no? No, sir. Okay, great. So then I'll just work with this. <laughs> okay, so um good 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 morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um as Emily stated, my name is Mount Allen, and uh, I'm with the San Francisco Jazz Organization. We are a 501. C3 not-for-profit organization um, in the city of San Francisco. And um, we've been open for about uh, 10 years right now. Uh, as you can see, the inside of the building on the right-hand side, we have, a, it's approximately a 700 seat venue. Um, and we are the, I guess you could say the second performance center specifically dedicated to jazz. Uh, the first one is is on the East Coast. It's called uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center. Uh, some of you may have may have heard of it. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we're celebrating our tenth anniversary just this week, um, which is obviously a very exciting thing for us. Um, we um, broke ground ten years ago and and started our performance. But prior to that. We actually, uh, we're a 40 year old organization and uh, we were nomadic in nature. So we were doing presentations uh, across the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area and venues that were not our own. So um, 
uh, our founder, a gentleman by the name of Randall Klein, had a bright idea that it would be great to have a, a home for jazz. And that is, uh, that's how we, we got going. So we just completed our San Francisco 40th Jazz Festival. Uh, it was a great success. And we're about to launch into now what we call uh, SF Jazz Summer Sessions, which is the second part of our season. And as you can see through the uh, through the lineup that's presented starting on the 13th of July, we have some uh, pretty well-known performers uh, in the in the jazz and blues world. Um, you know, just to highlight a few, there's an incredible tap dancer by the name of Sevian Glover. You may remember him from Bring in the Funk, Bring in the Noise. He uh, he will be performing on our stages with a tribute to, to uh, Gregory Hines and the Hoofers. And then uh, shortly following him, we'll feature uh, blues legend Taj Mahal. So, you know, kind of dating ourselves, or at least myself, in terms of some of these performers, um, because they've, they've been around quite a while. Uh, and then following that, we are, there's a gentleman by the name of Stanley Clark. And Stanley was part of that original Return to Forever band that featured uh, himself, Lenny White, um, Al Demiola, and, um, and the late Chick Corea. And so uh, Stanley is an NEA jazz master and uh, certainly are looking forward to that. So that's that's just a, a pinch of what's going on in the summer. And then we actually begin our next season. So I'm giving you some context for the for the remainder of the conversation. This isn't just a big ad. Uh, but by the way, if any of you are out in the San Francisco area during this time, I encourage you to uh, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to make arrangements for a performance uh, for you to experience. So please keep that in mind, and, and I will re remember that uh, offer. Uh, so we're about to start our 23rd, 24th season, which is our uh, uh, 11th season of the year, and I'm uh, sorry, of our existence. And very similar to the rest of them, we have some phenomenal performers. We actually have a house band called the SF Jazz Collective, um, and featuring that gentleman in the center on saxophone. Um, uh, oops. Oh, boy. I just just blanked on his name. Ah, Chris Potter. Thank you. He's our uh, our artistic director for the uh, San Francisco Jazz Organization uh, band. And if you if you haven't heard of SF Jazz Collective, you might have heard of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra uh, with Wynton Marcellus. And uh, Wynton is on the bottom center there. And uh, of course, he travels with that band and will be performing on our stages as we come up uh, moving uh, into our new season. And then one other highlight, I mentioned uh, Mr. Ravi Coltrane. For those of you with any uh, jazz background, you'll know that Ravi is the son of the legendary artist, Mr. John Coltrane and his wife, Alice Coltrane, who also, was also a phenomenal artist. And um, Ravi is a part of what we call our resident artistic director program. Uh, he will be uh, in residence doing all types of, of uh, exciting things. We kind of give them free reign to do whatever they would like while they are in residence. And uh, he'll take his four days and do, a, a, amongst other things, a tribute to the great Pharaoh Saunders. And, um, and then of course, uh, music of his mother and father. So that's the, the, the caliber of the type of performance that we do on a regular basis over the last 10 years that we've been in the building. And here's kind of a snapshot of what what our year last year looked like. Uh, we are a membership driven organization. So we have right now about 20,000 uh, annual members. And we did over 400 concerts in, in the course of that time last year, uh, which um, is quite a few. It's more averaging more than one a day. And, um, and we also distributed a lot of tickets to the community because um, I'm sure most of you know, San Francisco is not a cheap place to live. And uh, lots of folks 
don't have the type of disposable income that would allow them to, to attend on a regular basis. So uh, as a community effort outreach, we distribute lots of free tickets to ensure that uh, folks can, can come and hear this really wonderful cultural music. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice, which I'm hoping is of interest to all of us on the call, that uh, we serve about 23,000 students throughout our year. Uh, and that is in all kinds of capacities. Uh, we do much outreach into the community. We're in all of the middle schools in uh, both uh, San Francisco and Oakland, providing various types of music services, uh, which kind of launches off into what we do here, which is the focus of the rest of the conversation as it relates to education, which is appropriate for, for our conversation today. So as I mentioned, SF Jazz does a lot in the community. And if you'll notice up on the board above the stage, you'll see the name Scenic. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Scenic, that stands for the Corporation for Education Network Initiatives in California. And um, we became connected to Scenic as a result of, um, of a conversation that uh, Ann Doyle, I'm not sure if, if um, how many of you know Ann, but Ann is a part of the team for Internet Two. She's very involved in the cultural affairs element of uh, of I2. And um, when I was back in New York, uh, I actually participated. I opened up a building called um, Franklin. I'm sorry. Um, uh, well, the SF Jazz. So I'm sorry. The New York. Um, the new, uh, Lincoln Center, <laughs> Lincoln Center Jazz. I actually opened that building uh, um, way, way back when. And I was interested in having Internet 2 be more part of that building when they opened, but uh, I was not successful uh, with that endeavor at that time. So when the opportunity to come to San, move to San Francisco and open this building, uh, 10 years ago came part of part of my agreement to come aboard this team was to ensure that we had the presence of the research education network flowing through the veins of our building and they were in agreement with that so um, what was left was to convince scenic to allow us to be a part of it and Ann Doyle made the the appropriate uh, introductions to put me in direct contact with the gentleman by the name of Dr. Lewis Fox, who's the CEO and um, president of Scenic. And he and I had ex extenuating, ex extensive conversations, and uh, he agreed to bring us aboard as the first non-EDU performing arts center in the state of California to actually be on the research and education network. And our agreement was that, you know, it was a, it was a, proof of concept and that what we would do is we would do exciting things and highlight the possibilities of the network in a cultural scene. And um, as and if we were successful, then we could continue on with the use of a scenic as our internet service provider. So um, what we do with Scenic is we create collaborations. We create collaborations with schools, with libraries. I mean, pretty much the K through 20 segment we are engaged with in terms of, um, in terms of having music, uh, a part of the, the communities of, uh, that we are engaged with. And that really extends beyond California, but it certainly started in, in this vein. So I'd like to just take a, a, a short video. It's a couple of minutes, well, let's be real, it's three minutes long. And uh, I just give you just a, a, an indication of one of our programs that we run on a, on a regular basis. And it's called uh, uh, Exchanges from the Stage. You may want to fix the sound. 
Yeah, Mel, if there's sound coming through, we're not hearing it. All right. Okay. We're so excited to be here and to also have our kids all the way from places like San Diego. Can you hear me? We, we, we were hearing it just then, so go ahead. Thank you. Okay, were you hearing the music? We weren't really hearing the music, but we were hearing the gentleman speaking. Okay, so then I'll, I'll you tell me if you're not hearing what's going on. I'll, I'll go ahead and continue the play. Okay. Can I hear y'all from San Diego? All right. How about our kids over at Proust Middle School? How y'all doing? Okay. And how about our kids here in San Francisco? Let them, let them hear you. Go, go. <laughs> so the music that we play was championed by people like Duke Ellington, Charles Mingus, Nina Simone, Billie Holiday. And we've been inspired by that music. How we that I knew how it would seem to be free. And I wish I could break all the chains holding me. Mississippi Watts and to Ferguson, we have to weep and cry the blue. All those who's alive are done from the legislation, new so good. We hope the silence comes for you. Another round of applause for Marcus Shelby and his wonderful band, everybody. And I would love to get questions from every school if we can have that represented. Here. My school is OLG, and my question is, why does jazz only have certain instruments? Jazz kind of came together right in New Orleans, and so we had brass instruments, we had the drums and things like that. So I think it, it came out of tra the tradition of New Orleans, you know? So uh, hi, um, I'm from Samuel Jackman Middle School, and I was just wondering, uh, what do you guys do for your solos? Uh, do you write it down or do you uh, go up the chords or how does it, how do you um, end up making a solo that sounds so good? So what I try to do when I'm gonna play a solo is when I bring the horn up to my lips, I have no idea what, what I'm gonna play until I start playing. And so I'll play a phrase and that phrase will kind of lead me to what I'm gonna play next. It's like telling a story. And so you say one thing and then it kind of leads you to the next thing. And then you're also listening to the people in the band with you. They might play something uh, on piano that might make you think of something else. So then you might play that. Bye, bye. I'm gonna let it this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Say, yeah. Say, oh. Make some noise, oh. Make some noise if you want to share your lighter. And let it go. Okay, um, can you hear me? I'm still there, great. Yes. So, so um, we do that several times a year. We invite students into the hall and then we reach out to students across the, uh, the, the community. And it, it, once again, that's all of California and quite frankly now beyond. And we invite them to participate in this music too because you know, the, the federal government uh, passed something called the ESSA, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act. And part of that act is that our kids have the opportunity to experience the arts. And they specifically spelled out the music as one of the 
art forms that's acceptable to meet this qualification. And, uh, you know, it's not an if, if it's available, it's a requirement. So uh, many of the schools, especially in more remote areas, they don't have an opportunity to travel to metropolitan areas or even their regional areas to experience these types of things. So one thing that Scenic provides is a direct pipeline to all of these school public schools in California. And it is one of the most underused resources uh, technologically, one of the most underused educational technologies that uh, our schools uh, have at their disposal. So part of what we do is, tr is try and make them aware that they do have this as, um, as something that they can use, not just in the arts, but quite frankly in STEM. And I know that's usually said in reverse order, but um, from, from where I sit, you know, the arts are an integral part of life and certainly uh, need to be appropriately embedded into our world. And so, you know, how we find out about the schools that are able to participate in, there's something in California called the K through 12 high speed network. And um, what they do is they have a pulse on what's going on in all of the schools around the state. And as the pilot rolls out, they helped us identify the schools that had the, the most reasonable resources. Because although you might have a, a solid gig coming into your venue, that doesn't mean that your infrastructure allows for the transmission for the full use of that uh, that. Uh, technology to support your institution. It's uh, often referred to that it's an element of that last mile consideration. So the high speed network lets us know not only is this school appropriate in terms of their bandwidth, but also um, internally they have both the human resource and the infrastructure throughput to ensure that the signals that we send out to them will get to that classroom or that projector in such a way that it will optimize the experience. And so, you know, that this is the map by which we use, this is the map that we use to reach out to the schools across the state of California. Um, these are some of the hubs, and we do our best to uh, approach all of these communities from top to bottom uh, and, and ensure that they have some level of participation. And it's a, it's a pretty big technical push for many of these schools. Um, they're, you know, this is, this is just a, a, a rough schematic in terms of some of the um, the the routing that sits behind that. And this is really up to, uh, within the venue itself. Uh, this isn't, this doesn't uh, talk about getting the signal from us to them, but this is what, what's going on in, in their buildings uh, in, in uh, just so they can participate in these particular efforts. And you'll notice um, Walla Walla is actually in the state of Washington. So, uh, Prius School is down in Southern California in San Diego. Edna Brewer's right here in um, in uh, the Bay Area. So it's it's a it's a heavy lift to coordinate all of these schools and and have them interact with one another. Um, but we're we're really happy that some of the schools, once they experience this opportunity, uh, they take it upon themselves to, to move further with the technology and integrate it into the, their existing program. Uh, this is the case with one of the middle schools that we've worked with in the past, Toby Middle School, Toby Johnson Middle School. And they've, they've taken UltraGrid, which I'll speak on a bit more in a moment, um, and had made that a part of their collaborations with their peers, their peer institutions without the use of SF Jazz. And ultimately, you know, that's the goal, that these students get some level of familiarity with this level of tech. So they have some awareness of how this tech may uh, serve them moving forward. I believe, uh, I believe it was uh, the gentleman from, from Kaplan University that spoke of an experience that he had where um, 
um, he had a student that just didn't have the experience with this particular network and how that impacted him in terms of, of his, his pursuits. Types of programs that we're that, like we're doing introduce this technology to kids at an incredibly young age to the point that, that we're doing it without their knowledge of it. So as they progress through the education spectrum, the education continuum, by the time they're ready to get to college, they, they should have some understanding of of how this technology works. And we also um, we also work with libraries in the same vein, uh, the public library system in the state of California. We engage with them, providing performance and interactive, um, interactive, um, um, interactivity in terms of their locate their branches and us. So the same thing we're doing with the schools, we're doing with the public libraries, and and um, this is a mostly a regional consideration of California and the West Coast. So all of this, um, and you'll notice down in the in the corner of the, the, the graphics, it's Scottsdale, Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we most recently did a, a exchanges from the stage program, which is what this program is called, which, and we engaged um, Arizona uh, as well. So as I mentioned, it does span, uh, go, go beyond California itself. So as I mentioned, this program is called Exchanges from the Stage, and it's one of four elements of a, of a program that the San Francisco Jazz Organization has put together to fully engage with the research education network in a cultural way um, to show that there is, there is significant advantage and opportunity to engage the network in ways not normally thought of. That, um, and so once again, exchanges from the stage uh, is what we call, it is our lowest threshold for engagement with the research education network, which basically means they're the fewest um, technical requirements for full participation. Um, because we recognize, you know, a lot of the schools don't have those resources. And when we find those schools that don't have resources, we often provide those resources for them. Uh, and, you know, they might be on loan or, or they may be a gift. And it depends on our budget in particular. But this is an uh, inclusive program in that we're, we certainly target Title I schools, marginalized communities, but we do not exclude other schools because if they have, if schools have resources, if libraries have resources, then what we end up with is a, a controlled environment. Um, where we get to really see how particular pieces of equipment act in the same circumstances using, using the same networks. So one library that may be incredibly well off um, would inform our understanding of how the technology works in other communities that are not as well off. And in fact, will that will that understanding inform our ability to participate with schools um, and, in, and in, increase the opportunity for schools that have fewer resources to participate. I hope that makes sense. So we use the, we use the well-off schools to determine um, uh, viability for other communities in terms of the resources because we have an apples to apples comparison in terms of the equipment that's being used. And if we're successful with the um, with the lower threshold equipment, then that becomes a part of our uh, of our program. Um, so that's exchanges from the stage. And you can see there are three other uh, pieces to this puzzle, exploration, innovation, and iteration, which is our absolute highest end um, collaborative activities that usually only engage um, research one institutions um, and that institutions that have a pretty found firm foundation in the research education understanding. But what we find is that that understanding is usually on the scientific side of STEM and not so much uh, as it relates to the potential the potentiality of using them in the arts. 
And then there's a middle frame where what we call auditions and admissions, where we it's um, kind of it, in terms of the technicality of it kind of fits in the middle between exchanges from the stage and exploration, innovation and iteration. Uh, and so, you know, it's often we we uh, we do a lot of like master classes and things like that. And how this all plays out, it certainly plays out in terms of the applications that are used, the advanced network applications that are used, um, um, and the, the technical ability uh, and, cap and capacity of the institutions. You, the, the, the more involved, the more understanding of the network, the higher level of commitment folks need to have to the um, to the process. So as you can see in the bottom, there are a bunch of uh, proof of concept events, uh, activities that we've been involved with over the years. Um, and so he, this is UltraGrid. I just introduced one of our major players in terms of the uh, advanced applications. UltraGrid is a high-end video uh, application that we use on a regular basis and consider to be uh, an, um, 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 an entry-level opportunity for schools. So we use UltraGrid and that comes out of Marisic University, Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. And we, which, and we collaborate with the CESnet, um, the CESnet community there as well. Uh, then I'll jump on to what we have next is what is called Exploration, Innovation, and Iteration, which I mentioned. And um, from that perspective, we do uh, once again uh, introduce you to our friend Milos, who is a, a big player in the video world. And this is much beyond Skype or much beyond Zoom. We're talking um, 16k and, and above in terms of uh, in terms of uh, video quality. And, and we also work very closely with Stanford University. Stanford sponsors SF Jazz on the network. Um, and out of Stanford, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Chris Schaaf, Dr. Schaaf, who created the, uh, the Center for, for um, Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And um, Dr. Schaaf uh, created an application called Jack Trip. Jack Trip is a very high-end audio, very similar to UltraGrid is high-end video. Jack Trip is high-end audio and performs very well on, on, uh, on advanced networks and was actually developed at Stanford on the Scenic Network, which obviously collaborates very closely with uh, internet too. And so, um, parts of the parts of the the collaborations that we've done with these two applications, UltraGrid and um, and Jack Trip, um, we did a a a distributed performance between the University of California Davis um, and the New World Symphony in Miami. Who is a major player in the uh, in the world of performance on the on internet too, and uh, us at SF Jazz, and actually did a, a live performance during a during a conference um, um, years ago, um, and then something very very strange, and you can see that I tried to create a spooky kind of uh, slide. Um, George Lewis out of out of Columbia. University, uh, did a collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh, UC Irvine, and SF Jazz, where he's written a, a he created an application called Voyager. And Voyager is actually in, introducing the, the whole concept of AI into this overall conversation. And so at one location, there was a, a, a disc clavier and with a, a MIDI interface to, uh, to Jack Tripp um, that was uh, that was run by this program called Voyager, which actually improvises. And so there was a, a Voyager improvisational piano taking place uh, in in universe at University of Pitt, along with the second piano, um, another disc clavier, but actually being 
played. And then George Lewis, who's a, a, a trombonist, was uh, playing in that configuration. And they were playing with Francis Wong, who's a saxophone player, uh, using also Jack Tripp from SF Jazz. And then UC Davis, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, UC Irvine uh, with Michael Dessen, who's very well known for interfacing in this world, of, um, and Nicole Mitchell. Uh, who was recently uh, up at at UC, uh, I'm sorry, at U Pitt, and I believe moved on to the University of Virginia. So um, Internet 2 brought the, these, these uh, players together in a low latency performance featuring um, featuring these performers. And this is a this was a very high-end type of experimentation. So it requires um, it requires a lot of understanding of the network, a substantial bandwidth. As you'll see, uh, SF Jazz was the only venue that had did not have at least 10 gigs to perform. Uh, SF Jazz does now have 10 gigs, and I believe both the UC Irvine and uh, UPIT are up to 100 gigs. So it's it's a constantly moving piece. Okay, and so then moving forward. We then have the the last piece I'll talk about. It's the auditions and admissions. And the the whole concept with the auditions and admissions piece is to provide opportunities for uh, for there to be collaboration across the network uh, in in a more specialized um, um, teaching environment. And uh, we did a, a scenic conference way back in 2015 where, we had um, uh, also at UC Irvine, one of their jazz students uh, working with a master, Re Rebecca Mullion, master pianist from SF Jazz in a real time um, masterclass performance type activity. These, these whole concepts about um, not having to be in the same place at the same, not having to be in the same place at the same time are are how we push the limits of the network and those of you that may have been uh, at the uh, I think this was 217 the uh, I2 exchange that took place in San Francisco you will have seen the uh, another master class take place right on the stage where we engaged um, uh, a couple of master trombonists uh, and they had uh, they created a, a master class between um, Stanford, uh, SF Jazz, and the um, Tech Exchange Seventeen. So you know all of these things. If you think about them, they're about the distribution of signals and and latency more than anything else. And so you know, in ESNet said in. As they, as the whole Pacific Research Platform became a conversation, scientific progress completely unconstrained by the physical location of instruments, people, computational resources, or data. Um, and you know, we did a variation on that theme and uh, work from what we call the virtual marginalization of distance, where the virtual marginalization of distance is the result of minimizing the impact of perceived distance within communication cycles by use of advanced networking technology. Um, all of those programs, those programs ended up um, having SF Jazz receive uh, innovations in networking award. Um, and back in 2015. And since that time, we've just continued on uh, with the goal of going, going beyond the nation and starting to play a larger game um, with, with our folks in Giant. So, you know, obviously the, the, um, the speed of light is a constraint in any of these concerns. But if you consider, <coughs> excuse me, a decade ago, um, latency was was far longer than it is now, regardless of where you were in the world. And we see the opportunity to continue working in these test environments as a research and development element of the network and of the jazz community, <coughs> excuse me, to make contributions along this way. And, um, you know, this conversation I've been a part of for quite some time, 
dating back um, back to really before 2017, when the first National Research Platform event was held, when it, it the conversation recognized that TCUs and M HBCUs were were entering this conversation about um, about access and um, what Internet Two is doing now with MSCC is just it's phenomenal because it's pointing to the opportunity that the some of the marginalized institutions across the world across our across our nation will be able to participate on, on a research level collaboratively with their peers across the world. And that, that opens the opportunity, of course, for um, the arts to play a bigger role in this conversation as well. So I'll, I'll conclude this, I'll wrap this up by, by referring to a quote by a, a pianist by the name of Jerry Allen, who's recently passed, who was an advocate of participation on this network, uh, was at the University of Pitt and was instrumental in many of the uh, uh, collaborations that took place across the country on this level. Uh, we are interested in ways the academy can connect with the community to create new opportunities for shared collaborative educational equity. We're continuing to explore ways of creating community through this technology. And that's, that's what SF Jazz is all about, um, having the opportunity to use jazz as a vehicle to support uh, educational equity. Um, and so in closing, I'd just like to, to thank the, the scenic team, and I'd especially like to thank the Internet 2 team um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, well, I, I don't think I did actually. Howard, the CEO and president, if you if you're not aware, he's he's a quite accomplished musician, and um, uh, you, we should encourage him to to do some performance in an upcoming uh, in an upcoming conference at some point in time. Um, and I'd like to thank him because he's been a part of my conversation for quite some time. Obviously, the President and CEO of Scenic has been a, a huge supporter of all of the activities on the cultural level. You know, brought to 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 the attention years and years ago the need to uh, make sure that the tribes were a part of this conversation. He's actually written uh, about that, and um, and um, and Ann Doyle, who's been very instrumental in attempting to create connections uh, across the the diaspora of HBCUs in terms of um, finding opportunities to for SF Jazz to collaborate. So it's very exciting, the things that are happening now on the MSCC plane with the pilot of, of institutions that are coming aboard. Um, that means I'll soon have access to them. Because right now I can, I can collaborate with Harvard, which I've done, but I haven't been able to collaborate with Howard. Uh, and so, I know that um, you know Tennessee State is coming aboard, which is really really exciting, and uh, and and several other institutions. But the point being, there are about nine hundred other I'm sorry nine hundred ninety other H uh, HBCUs out there that I'm really looking forward to collaborating with, and uh, these coming aboard right now are will be the pilots for those collaborations to come in the future. So just want to say thank you to the Internet 2 team, MSCC, for allowing me to participate in this ongoing conversation and know that I'm I'm committed to the success, the success of the program. Okay, that's it. Mount, thank you so much. We've we've got a, a couple of questions. If I could ask you to bring down your screen, Mountain, then that way we can all sort of see each other. Uh, Dr. Allo, you have your hand raised. Dr. Allo, you're you're on mute. Okay, really glad to see this um, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Richard Allo, dean of the College of uh, Science and Technology here at Florida A&M University. Uh, I've seen your presentations many times. I'm senior personnel on both the PRP and the NRP, and um, 
and we've talked before about engaging um, our HBCUs. And so I'll, I will be sending you a note and uh, hope to get back to you um, offline, okay? And could discuss things. We have a developmental research school here at uh, Florida a and K through 12. We'd like to discuss that with you. Fantastic, look forward to it. Thank you.